Hello everyone, welcome to the Fight Network Studios. This is Five Rounds. I am John Ramdi and alongside Robin Black and like UFC 73, this show is absolutely stacked. We will be joined by a UFC champion, one of the sport's top trainers, a top UFC welterweight, as well as an official for the Ultimate Fighting Championship, a referee and a judge. Uh, but the hot topic still on everybody's mind, UFC 167, George St. Pierre successfully uh, defending his welterweight crown against Johnny Hendricks. And a lot of people not very pleased with the outcome. People believe that Johnny Hendricks should be the new, new UFC welterweight champion uh, because they looked at, I think, different criteria than the, what is supposed to happen when it comes down to scoring. People believe that Johnny Hendricks landed the bigger blows, banged up George St. Pierre's face, uh, was able to stop some takedowns, and that's why he should be the new welterweight champion. But it doesn't work that way. Yeah, if this was Pride, the old beloved scoring system of Pride, who did more damage, who won the fight as a complete haul, I think Johnny Hendricks won that fight. When you look at the 10 minutes that he won definitively on the scorecards, those were 10 mean, vicious, pounding minutes. The other 15 that are in question, George won two of those rounds, I think, in most people's scorecards, but he won them by edging them, and then there was the all-important first round. When you look at it as a whole, Johnny Hendricks beat up George St. Pierre, but when you look at the score, scoring system, round by round scoring, that complicated system that we use in mixed martial arts of five rounds. George won two of them, arguably three. And I think that's the bigger picture here, looking at the scoring of mixed martial arts, because it's not the first time we've seen controversial decisions. A lot of people believe that Alexander Gustafson defeated John Jones, and you just look back in history, this happens time and time again because people are unclear of the scoring criteria when it comes to mixed martial arts. Yeah, and there is a certain amount of bias. We, we, uh, we felt that George won round one and people are accusing us of being biased because we're Canadian and George is Canadian. There's a certain instinctive human bias that's in there. There's a bias in the judge, judges, there's a bias in anybody watching it when you're cheering for a certain person. You try to remove it by looking at it as independently as possible, but you're influenced by the sound of the crowd when you're a judge, you're influenced by the momentum of a fight, you're influenced by, you know, all manner of little things. Bias doesn't mean you're doing it on purpose, but it means you're being influenced. But this is a sport like figure skating, and a million other sports that comes down to judges. Well, a man that was in the corner of George St. Pierre is trainer for Ross Ahabi. We had the good fortune to talk to him about the scoring in general of mixed martial arts. You got to go round by round, you know. If the fight is scored overall, then fight overall, you know, uh, finish strong. But if I beat you for four rounds and you break my jaw in the fifth round and you don't have a mark on you in those four rounds, I still win. It's round by round. You have to play the game the way the rules are, are made. They made those rules because that's what they consider to be better. So uh, for sure you're going to strategize accordingly to that. If I beat you 10 to 9, 10 to 9, 10 to 9, and then you can completely dismantle me in the last, but don't finish me, you lose. That's how round by round scoring works. And it's not good, it's not great, it's just, it's just what it is. And if they change the rules tomorrow, we're going to change the way we fight and we're going to change the way we prepare. I think you should take away rounds. It should be one 25-minute round. It should be just based on one round. There's no need to do mathematics and add things up and, and worry about the timing, watching the clock. This has nothing to do with fighting. I think they should weigh fighters in the day of the fight as well. You both can't be more than 10 or 15 pounds heavier. Everybody move up a weight class if you're dropping 20, 30 pounds, 40 pounds. Some guys, some guys win a fight because they know how to diet better. They know they know how to work their. Some, unfortunately, some guys do hormones. Some guys do EPO. Some guys do a lot of drugs. This is not why you should be crowned champion. I'm not accusing anybody. I'm just saying there is drugs in the in the in this in this industry. You should be champion because you're the best fighter, not because of some judge's opinion, not because of some mathematical formula, because you are the best fighter. You should be way the same as the guy you're fighting. You should be in the same ballpark. You shouldn't be cutting twice as much weight. It's not fair. You should show up there and fight one big round. If you're down on the ground, you should be able to get up on your own. The bell shouldn't be able to save you. You know, it, it really harms the grapplers. I really believe that you have all finishes. Almost all fights will be finished if you have 25 minutes to do your business. And Faraz Sahabi talking about how we can improve mixed martial arts. And, you know, these are, this is a team that's very intelligent. They say these are the rules right now that the UFC are... That when fighters step inside of the cage, this is the criteria. We use those rules to base our, our strategy yeah. and the way to win fights. Uh, moving forward, uh, 
it, if the sport changes, if the scoring criteria changes, will people follow suit and change their game plan based on the scoring? Yeah, they must. And, and fights look the, the way they look now because of a million variables and how they're scored, the rounds, all of these things are those variables. These are some of the most brilliant minds, the coaches and the trainers and the dietitians, and they're putting together. It's all one big global experiment being uh, done in real time with hundreds and hundreds of fighters and thousands of people to find out what works best. But as we're getting down to who is the best fighter, what is the best recipe to build the best fighter, we're being influenced by these other things. And that's what Faraz is talking about. Great clip with Faraz, by the way. Great clip. He's talking about weight and diet and size and rounds and all of these things influencing the outcome of who's the best fighter, where I think the global experiment that is the UFC is trying to solve the, the riddle of who is truly the best fighter, not who's the best at operating within all these variables. Uh, one good thing we know is uh, everybody's trying to give their input. Everybody Everybody's trying to make the sport of mixed martial arts uh, the best it possibly can be. We had the chance to talk to a top-ranked 170-pound fighter who has been a world champion in jiu-jitsu, and he gives his thoughts on how to improve mixed martial arts. We could do, you know, better, better rules, you know, and also we could do like, like other sports. I think every round they should they should show who won, you know, which referee gave to one, because then the fighter knows. Because in the last round, I thought I was winning because I was more aggressive and that's why you know I didn't I, I was more defending and punching him and defending takedowns so if you have every round you know your 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 corners can watch and and the public can watch and also on TV would be much much more exciting because you know sometimes you 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 in a three rounds fight you lose the the two rounds but you don't know you think oh maybe it's even the third one you know if you think it's even you're not gonna do that much but if you if you're sure, okay, I lose this one, I lose this one, in the third round you go like, like crazy, you know? So it would be much more exciting for the sport. So I think that's a good improvement for the sport, you know, and easy. You know, every round in the, the big screen, put who in the round, like 30, 27 to this guy, you know? Because you never know, you know? And Robin, Damian Maya giving his thoughts. And do you like that idea? Because I personally like it. Because if I think if fighters see that they, they go out, they win that first round, yet on the scorecards, the, the judges say, no, you did not win that round. I think that does change the complexion of the fight. Uh, you've been in there in the past. Is this something that you like? Uh, I think it would change the complexion very much. You would see more finishes in the third round. And not only because I'm like, oh man, I'm down two rounds. I better rush. But in doing so, I'm going to be open for you finishing me as well. But you know what? This uh, raises a really interesting one because as soon as we look at one guy's opinion, you look at Ferocious and you go, great ideas. But then you see a different one in each of these different ideas, each of these different proposed changes, they they change strategy, they ch change mentality, they change mental training, they change physical training, they change everything. So when you introduce multiple different ideas, you see how hard it is to make any change at all. It's a fascinating conversation. It's one we're going to have more and more, I think. Uh, again, coming out of UFC 167, we heard UFC President Dana White criticizing George St. Pierre because he said, you know, he wants to take some time away from the sport because, you know, to deal with any of the outside issues that all of us deal with on a regular basis, where we don't go through training camps to face off against the Best fighters in the world so I understand why George St. Pierre needed to take time away but it seems like the UFC kind of rushing him back in there to get this rematch with Johnny Hendricks uh, do you agree that do, do, should George St. Pierre get back get back on the horse so to speak so quickly well if it's my business it's my company and I'm making lots of money and I know that rematch is going to be huge of course I want him to I want that guy in there tomorrow making me millions of dollars and keeping the momentum of the sport going but he's a human being and human beings cannot be urged to go and and compete in a physical combat sport that's dangerous when they're not 100% mentally ready. You're either, yes, I want this fight, maybe means no. And if, if you're a maybe fighter, if you're not quite there, you need a break. That is the reality. Anybody who's got in there and fought knows the difference between everything going perfectly mentally for a training camp and to go fight and any variable. And when you're at the highest level against a guy who can literally knock you unconscious or harm you, if you're not ready, you don't fight. Well, we get to hear we heard from one of the pound for pound best fighters in the entire world who weighed in on the entire George St. Pierre situation. Yeah, I do, you know, I do. I've, uh, I've been on the receiving end several times from the UFC uh, as far as, you know, having that happen uh, with, negative, with negative backlash and stuff like that. Um, it's gonna happen, you know. Um, what I do is I just try to protect myself, protect my brand, and do what's right for me and my family at all costs. And, um, 
you know, I really don't think I really don't think George owes anyone anything. I think he was given a fair opportunity, the same opportunity everyone else had, uh, who's been a part of the UFC. And George has taken this opportunity and run with it. And he's uh, he's made a lot of money from the UFC, and I'm sure the UFC's made a ton of money off of him. So, so yeah, I don't I don't really think he owes uh, anyone anything. And most important thing as an athlete is just to take care of yourself, your brand, and your family. The thing is, as a, as a UFC fighter, you know, you're, you're kind of like the president of your own name, and you're the CEO, and you're like, you're everything. Uh, you know, it's an individual sport. So um, you always have to have an idea of what you want out of the whole thing and where you want to be aligned. Um, but you also have to remember that if you're not totally dedicated to the actual moment, then your, your future plans aren't going to happen. So uh, what I do is I look at what the fans are seeing. I look at what, what the UFC may be thinking or and how I feel about things. And I just come up with uh, this big this big sum, you know, and, and, and I, uh, you know, I just level it all out that way. I just I realize what I got to do and, uh, to get to where I want to be. And I just live in the moment and do what I'm doing in the moment wholeheartedly. And that's how it works. Interesting comments from the UFC light heavyweight champion John Jones and I like what he said because you know what he is the commodity the UFC needs George St. Pierre they need stars right now because if they want to continue to make boatloads of money they need guys like that and for John Jones to say you know you're the president and CEO of George St. Pierre uh -huh. Inc that means you get to you get to make all the calls and the most important thing is to Make sure that you're healthy when you leave the sport of MMA. Yeah, man, you got to like John Jones. He's a very, very smart guy. He's on the top of his game and his skills, and but he understands his brand. He understands kind of, you know, how to sell the idea of John Jones and how to beat everybody. He's balancing all these important things. He's only 25 years old. He's very, very smart. He's looking at guys like Anderson Silva and George St. Pierre and seeing that maybe there is a burnout, even when you're the best in the world, where you can't stay there forever. He wants to get out at 30. That's a smart dude. When we come back, we will hear from a UFC official about possible rule changes and who actually won the fight between George St. Pierre and Johnny Hendricks. Welcome back to Five Rounds, and right now we are joined by an official in mixed martial arts. He is a referee and judge for the Ultimate Fighting Championship, as well as a former fighter. Jaron Valal, thank you so much for joining us here on Five Rounds. Uh, we got to talk about the hot topic still in MMA. UFC 167, the main event, George St. Pierre versus Johnny Hendricks. People are freaking out because Johnny Hendricks did not, uh, did not claim the UFC welterweight title. What was your take on the main event? Well, I don't think there's cause for freak out, but yeah, I, I scored it as well. Uh, the same way I think the vast majority of the media did as well as some of the public, and I scored it for Johnny Hendricks. And the rounds I scored for him are one, two, and four. And the reason I don't think there's um, cause for concern or alarm, it really ba breaks down into how you parse out round one. The details within round one really drive your decision. I would suggest that no matter how you think of the fight, most people will grant Johnny rounds two and four, and how you break out round one is where you'll land and as to who won. Now, uh, two judges gave that round to Johnny Hendricks, as well as some members of the media, like Mr. Ramdeen and myself, and uh, uh, Chael Sonnen did, and Kenny Florian did, and so there were a number of people that, that saw it going to George. Why did you and that other judge and a lot of the public see it going for Hendricks? Well, um, based on the judging criteria, I think most of us are assessing the damage related to elbows as significant. And those elbows are what I think sway most of us to give it a close 10-9 for uh, Hendricks. I think others uh, end up not regarding the damage related to the elbows as significant, and then they give it a very close 10-9 for George. I'd hope that no one would give it a moderate or decisive 10-9 in either direction. <laughs> Now, now, Jaron, uh, you, you uh, instruct other judges, you've judged uh, for the UFC, ref, fought yourself. Tell me straight up, man, is there no such thing as a 10-10 round? Because if we've both seen it that way, different guys are, are disagreeing. Isn't this the kind of round that somebody could call a 10-10? It's very rare, very, very rare for there to be uh, a 10-9 round. And the incidents 
where that happens is so rare. It's almost a blue moon. Uh, the reason you get paid the big bucks, I joke, and wear the fancy suits as a judge is that you're supposed to be able to parse out the difference and relay it back to the judging criteria. And uh, that said, there are times when all things are even in a round and you turn to things like aggression or octagon control as a deciding factor. And that may be an argument as to the need for a 10-10 round. I personally would say that it's rare. However, could it happen? It's possible. Now, we've heard from uh, mixed martial arts fighters as well as trainers that uh, the rules need to change for MMA. The scoring criteria needs to change. You obviously are around commissions. Uh, what are some of the things that could be um, implemented to make the sport, uh, I think, more towards what people are looking for that are in the game, whether it be the fighters themselves, the promoters, or the trainers? Well, I'll ask you guys this question. Do you agree that the sport's evolved so much just from those observing that we can even have this discussion today where we're parsing out the details of a close round like round one. Yeah. It's amazing, right? It is amazing. Yeah, and, and I mean, that is that goes to the knowledge, but it also goes to what's happening in the coaching room and in the training room, that guys are coming in with different complex you know, uh, skills that they put to it, but also with game plans that revolve around trying to get that 10-9 and coming out as unheard as possible, especially in a 25-minute fight. Robin, that point is perfect. When I rewatch round one, one of the things that makes me smile is Faraz's strategy. I hope people appreciate what happened in round one. And, you know, definitely one of the most underrated coaches and strategists in the sport. His thought and the process of GSP implementing the takedown right off the beginning to keep uh, Hendricks light on his feet and not being able to commit to strikes as hard as he wants because he had to worry about the takedown was brilliant. The, the strategies being used do drive out close rounds sometimes. As far as changes to the criteria, I'm open to anything if it was ratified and certified by the majority of commissions uh, under the ABC. However, what I think and most people in the sport think, um, us fight nerds, it's about familiarity, that the judges and referees need to be super familiar, not only with the rules, but with the portions of the sport that make up our great sport, striking and the grappling arts. You can't plead ignorance to the movements in the grappling arts and not be able to parse out those details. So one thing I would hope is obviously better training, but also some sort of filtering of uh, judges and referees where it's based on knowledge of the sport and not just experience in combative sports uh, isolated to one sport or another. Yeah, because right now we're still seeing a discrepancy in the quality of referees and judges uh, throughout North America and really around the world. And I, I think it just comes down to education. So what has to be done? Is it the commissions all have to get together to say, okay, we all have to be on the same page. We all have to have the same level of qualified referees and judges. And whose responsibility is that to ensure that happens? Well, it's up to each jurisdiction for sure, each commission. I think the sport as a whole is progressing in the right direction. I think many of the commissions are evolving and progressing. You know, Canada, as an example, is, is doing a great job focusing on training and criteria and establishing support programs and, and mentoring programs. Uh, there's other jurisdictions in the states that are doing that. It's happening worldwide. So progress is being made. I think that this issue is being highlighted now, which is great. I think it's been an issue that's been in our sport for a long time. It will probably tend to be an, uh, an issue ongoing. As you know, in figure space, skating and other sports, anything where it's subjective related to a judge's opinion, it's going to bring up controversy from time to time. There's going to be different, different, differing opinions. The goal, however, is to level set so everyone interprets those rules the same way, whether they're as we know them today or as they continue to evolve and change. Everyone has to have the same context interpretation. And, um, I think it's getting better, but probably not at the pace that most of us want. He is mixed martial arts official Jaron Vala. When we come back to five rounds, we are looking ahead to the ultimate fighter finale. Welcome back to Five Rounds on November 30th. The Ultimate Fighter 18 finale goes down in Sin City. The main event, Nathan Diaz taking on Gray Maynard in a rematch. But first things first, Robin, are you interested in what's going on with the Ultimate Fighter? Considering you go back to season one, we've seen guys like Diego Sanchez, Forrest Griffin. Uh, Forrest Griffin won the title. S very relevant guys when it comes to mixed martial arts. It seems right now it's going to take some of these guys off the reality show 
years to make a serious impact. Yeah, I'm not personally all that interested, and I am the biggest combat sports fan on Earth next to maybe you. <laughs> and, you know, I love the, the UFC. I love the, the global aspect of the sport and who these fighters are, and I love to see great, great fighters. And as you start to care about them because of their high level of skills, you get to know their personality, you get to care about them because of their stories and so forth. This show tries to do the opposite, tries to give you people that you may care about because they're interesting television uh, personalities and then makes you watch the sport. It doesn't work for me on that high level anymore and I think the ratings are starting to go down. I don't know how much longer it'll be around, but uh, I sure like this main event and I'm certainly not one to, to uh, you know, talk down about something. It's just not my cup of tea compared to some of the great aspects I think one of the reasons why it's not that interesting to me is because the, you can't really invest any t time in some of these fighters because one or two losses in the UFC, whether it be on the finale or their next event, and they're gone from the UFC yeah. and they have to climb their way back up. So I think it's once they get into the UFC, make an impact, win four or five fights in your division, and then people will start talking about you. But we got to talk about yes. the main event before we go. Uh, Nathan Diaz taking on Gray Maynard. Both guys kind of have their back up against the, against the wall uh, for Diaz lost his last two yeah. fights. Maynard, one win in his past three fights. I'm surprised that this is a main event. Two quality uh, fighters, no doubt about it, but really, where do these guys fit in the grand scheme of things at 155 pounds? Well, this fight matters because they fought before a couple times, once on the show, and uh, like you said, they're both in that position. We know both guys. We know both guys are outstanding 155-pound athletes, and one of them is going to reset and move forward with this win and one move back. You know, for Diaz, it's the first time he's lost uh, two fights in a row for quite a while, but the last time he did, he came back with wins over Gomi, Cerrone, and Jim Miller, one of the best stretches in this career so he could do that again for Maynard this is the first big road bump he's ever had two great quality fighters and both of them need to win badly and for my money that makes a very good main event uh, for Gray Maynard I think he has a little bit of a luxury here because uh, training alongside Josh Thompson who last defeated yeah. uh, Nathan Diaz. So I think Gray Maynard, uh, wiser, more powerful, training with good 155-pound fighters. So I think this is his fight to win. Yeah, I don't know, man. I like uh, I like Diaz in this fight. The, the, one of the tickets to beating a Diaz uh, brother is to attack those legs. It's never been a big part of Maynard's game. But uh, good fighters, both guys desperate. It's going to be a good one. It may not go three rounds. All right, we got to thank for Ross Sahabi, John Jones, Damian Maya, the guys at Empire MMA, Neil Forrester. And we're going to give a shout-out to the guys at Martial Law. On behalf of Robin Black and our entire Fight Network crew, I am John Ramdeen. Oh, we got to thank Jaron Valal as well. On that note, I'm John Ramdeen saying so long. We'll see you next time on Five Rounds.